Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 201, Underrated, Hidden Gem Board Games. I'm Sean, your host, and here with me live, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. Remember that we record live Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop, and you should come join us in the lobby, our chat room. Yes, that's a new time starting next week, but more about that in a bit. Now that episode 200 is out in the wild, it's time to move on with the next 100. For this episode, we've got quite a bit of feedback in the suggestion box. We've got an announcement about a new starting time. We then answer a question about hidden gem board games from someone who's beginning becoming or already is part pretty much a meme for this show, which is followed by a detailed review of Disney Sorcerer's Arena. This is one of the games that is currently in our big 200 episode celebration giveaway. And we wrap up talking about the games we've been playing. During all of our shows, we mention a lot of different games, other podcasts, Kickstarters, articles, game publishers, and more. Be sure to check the show notes for links to these various things we mentioned. You can find them at tabletopbellhop.com slash episode 200. No, that URL will not work for that style of URL will not work for older episodes. This is something new we are doing with a new redirect. So don't try that for episode 199 or anything else. And uh, that should actually say episode 201, not 200. So yes, tabletopbellhop.com slash episode 201. All one word, which you should be able to use going forward for each of our episodes, as long as we don't forget to do the redirects on Tuesday morning. So it'll be a quick way to get to our show notes. Now with that, let's get started over on the suggestion box. Welcome to the suggestion box. Here we share some comments, replies, and emails we've gotten about our content. Let's start off with a couple of the many comments we got about hitting episode 200. Wayner396 commented, Congrats on 200 episodes, guys. I'm hoping for many more to come. Love the show. And this awesome one comes from Kim Brebeck from Good Games Publishing. You have a great podcast and cover games from a variety of angles, giving some back and forth from various angles to help listeners decide whether this just might be a game for them. Just how we like it. Well, thanks everyone, uh, Kim and Wayner, as well as everyone else who commented on our milestone. Speaking of that, we do have some comments on in content, sorry, comments on content to feature some of the games that are in our current big giveaway. So this is things people had to say about games we are giving away. Andy Moran commented on our Hidden Games crime scene review to say, thanks. This helped a ton in making a gift decision. Nowhere else could I find a review for this, let alone such an in-depth, organized, and spoiler-free video. Well, they followed up this past week to say, update, girlfriend loved it, and we're now obsessed with this game genre. If you find any other good brands, please update. Hidden Games only has out two of these in the U.S. Well, hey, Andy, I'm glad you enjoyed the game and your girlfriend loved it and went on to pick up the other one in the series. Now, other brands you might want to check out are the Mysterious Package Company, Uh, who we are not working with yet because they sent us an awesome looking escape room box, one of the best we've ever seen, that ended up having a misprint. So we're still waiting for the updated part. If you do end up checking out Mysterious Package Company, they honestly do have the most impressive physical stuff I've seen in one of these games. Use code TABLETOPGAMINGDEALS, all one word, to save 10% off. Other companies include Puzzling Pursuits, the Exit series of games from Cosmos, the Unlock series of games, I think, from Space Cowboy, and the Coded Chronicles games from The Op. One other one that's a, a much cheaper option that you might want to look into, especially if you like the murder mystery aspect of things and the puzzling, is Escape Mail, which will deliver to your door an escape room experience in an envelope. Well, next, to comment on our Aventuria review on YouTube. This one comes from Andre Thanhauser. My opinion, the decks, rules, and mechanics don't offer enough depth to get that game only for the dueling mode. You need to be aware of the rolling dice for almost everything, including the very random number of damage points you inflict, does not make for a tense duel in which the better player mostly wins. This doesn't bother me at all when it comes to the adventure mode. In fact, it makes for a tense and exciting gameplay, and quite often, good and bad rolls even out over the course of the game. 
I can't argue with this. Uh, for everything positive we said about Adventuria, pretty much all of it's about the cooperative adventure mode. Neither of us really dug the adventure dueling mode at all. Um, what's interesting, though, is the publishers themselves have now recognized this, that that's how most people like to play Adventuria. And that's why their latest Kickstarter and all upcoming focus will be for cooperative play only. Well, next we have a comment from Matt Thomason about the One Ring from Free League. Seconding your opinion of the One Ring. It captures the feel perfectly. Mm -hmm. You can really tell it was written for the job rather than the square peg of Middle Earth being crammed into a round hole of an existing rule set. Yeah, I don't think Matt and I or us are, are the only ones who feel this way. Yes, you can pretty much use any game, any RPG to play any genre or story, um, but games designed specifically to tell specific type of stories tend to do better than generic ones, especially when doing with the license setting. Well, finally, we want to thank everyone for the comments on our giveaway itself. Yeah, keep them coming. The more people that comment on our posts and the giveaway itself on the blog, the more attention it'll get. That's just the way the algorithms work. I'm very pleased with our results so far, as it just started this week. We've already got more entries than any of our past contests. Well, that's it for this week's comments. We always love it when you comment on our posts. Email mo at tabletopbellhop.com or reach out on social media. Now, for those of you just hearing about our giveaway, it's time for some more details in the announcements. Of course, the big announcement is that our huge 200th episode celebration giveaway is live right now over on the blog. Yeah, thanks to 12 awesome sponsors, we've launched our biggest giveaway ever with 39 different prizes. Tune into our last episode or go to the giveaway page for a full list. But this giveaway includes awesome individual games like the Fort Knock Box from Escape Well, Land and Sea from Good Games Publishing, and Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade from Japanime Games. It also includes some packages, like the Chronicles of Avel bundle with the core game, the Adventurer's Toolkit, and the Meeple stickers from Rebel Studio, and the One Ring bundle with the core rulebook, the starter set, and the Lore Master screen. There is some seriously great stuff up for grabs, including some of the best games we've ever played. To enter, head over to tabletopbellhop.com slash giveaway. There you'll find a full list of the games that are up on offer, some info on each, and an entry form at the bottom of the page. As explained there, this giveaway is open worldwide, though some prizes are limited to the U.S. and Canada. Good luck. Now, before we get to tonight's question, we also need to announce a new starting time for our live show. It's not going to affect those of you who just listen at home, but for anyone joining us live. For a few years now, we've been recording all of our podcast episodes live on Twitch at Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern. As of next week, that's going to change. So our 9 p.m. start time was decided back when Sean was still in Hamilton and when my kids were much younger. It's basically based on chores and household duties we had to do and bedtimes for the kids, rather than what we thought was actually a good time for an audience to watch us or to record. Now, we've noticed that due to this late start, we tend to lose viewers as the night goes on, especially with 11 p.m. That seems to be the cutoff for most people. Well, now that my kids are older, obligations have changed. We've decided that an 8 p.m. Eastern start time would probably be better. This still fits in with both of our schedules and should let more people join us live or at least stick around longer. Now, this change does go into effect next week, which is our Wednesday, March 29th recording of episode 202. Uh, 29th? I don't think so. Did I say 29th? 22nd. March 22nd recording. It says 22nd. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't even it. know. That was a brain burn, not anything there. That's it for the announcements this week. Let's get to answering one of your questions and let you ask the bellhop. We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. So tonight's cup. Uh, wow. Total fail at talk again. At least I didn't read the wrong number. Sorry about that. Tonight's question comes from weird, better known by fans of the show as Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton. Though that joke doesn't quite work as well as it used to. Well, weird asks what hidden gems are out there. 
More specifically, what games don't have any coverage that you think are definitely worthy of the spotlight? Well, thanks for the question, Weird. Uh, this is a good one. Now, while they are asking for games that don't get any coverage, that's pretty much the rare game indeed. I can't think of a game in my collection that doesn't have at least a little bit buzz going around, at least with a certain small groups, unless I start to get into obscure indie RPGs like Triple X Street Luge. Now, what we are going to share are um, a number of games, 15 games I think we got to, that we see as hidden gems, and then a few honorable mentions that I couldn't decide if they fit on the list for one reason or another. Now, these are games that aren't getting enough attention or that people may have completely missed. Yeah, to me, a hidden gem is that game that you find yourself telling everyone about because somehow it slipped under the radar. The mm -hmm. game that you know is a winner, but no one else has heard of. Yeah, I can also see it as when I'm listening to a podcast and they mention it and you're like, yes, no one talks about that game. I get quite a few of those. I'm like, oh, it's awesome. You also discovered that awesome game and you're telling people about it. It is so awesome to hear you talk about that. Yes, you're you're part of the team, right? You get that kind of team spirit going with some of these games. You're like rooting for the underdog. I guess it's the same feeling. Although when you do hear about it, hear about it on the other podcast, it becomes less of a, a hidden gem every time yeah, you hear it on the podcast. That's true. <laughs> if, you, if you hear it on one other podcast, cool. And you start hearing about all of them, I, you can still be happy. I'm still like, yes, other people have discovered this awesome game. But yes, it's no longer a hidden gem at that point once everyone talks about it. Though I guess our list tonight are all games we hope that'll happen with. Absolutely. And one thing we actually noticed building this list is sometimes it's uh, sort of chronological. So a game may have gotten a bit of buzz uh, early on mm -hmm. uh, and then disappeared into obscurity while it's still a great game and possibly even still available to buy. Uh, it has fallen off everyone's radar. Yeah, I'm thinking we could possibly do a completely, well, there would be some overlap, but another list of like forgotten games, mm -hmm. games we used to love, yeah. where 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 games everyone was hyped about, but no one talks about anymore. Not even necessarily us. Like yeah. for us, that's, that's but, Azul, but, but I'm that, thinking like in general. Yeah, yeah, games that were the big, a big deal for 15 minutes and disappeared. So... I think it's time to get to our list. I did double check. So we have 13. So what's 13? I couldn't remember what number we stopped at. 13 games and then some honorable mentions as well. All right. Well, on to the games. As usual, this list is in no particular order. All right. So my number one is a game I would have never heard of, except I had reached out to Rio Grande Games when we were hosting Extra Life Gaming events. And during our Extra Life events, I wrote out to a bunch of companies and I said, hey, are you willing to donate games either for our group to play during Extra Life and we'll share pictures on social media or to put into our auction where we'll raise money for charity? One of those games, uh, Rio Grande in particular, sent a bunch of demo copies. And it was interesting because they showed up with stickers that said, not for sale, this is a demo copy. And one of those games is Tiffin. Now, Tiffin is about a South Asian tradition of delivering Tiffins, which is a certain type of lunch tray, to people at businesses they are, where there are Tiffins that go onto the back of these little scooters and they bring them to people at lunch and then people have hot lunches. To fit this, this is a pickup and deliver game where you are trying to deliver Tiffins to different um, sites. You put three sites out and you try to deliver Tiffins to them. And you're, what you're doing is filling in cubes on a bar and it's kind of an area control thing. So it's kind of like the smash up bases, but instead you're delivering hot food to office spaces. It is a really unique game that almost no one is talking about, no one's heard of. And honestly, I would have completely missed had Rio Grande not sent this. Now, I don't know if someone at Rio Grande was like, oh, we have a thousand copies of Tiffin, send that. <laughs> or if they were like, no, more people have to try this because it's really good. Fair enough. Uh, I, it's, the Tiffin is, and that's the, the Indian. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, the Indi Indian yeah. lunch delivery. Yes. Uh, fantastic. Uh, fantastic you know, way of doing things, honestly. It's, it's, the, yeah. the, it's, it's something that would, would benefit... Uh, everyone if it, if it happened in more places than just in India. no honestly i agree uh but that was tiffin now i don't know if I, how we didn't discuss how we were going to talk about this but what i thought was interesting is when i put the list together and sean and i kind of worked together on this one uh we also noted down how many ratings the game had on board game geek so i think i want to call that out for each game as well just to show how much how hidden these gems are so how hidden is tiffin <laughs> Yeah, too. well, Tiffin, 106 people rated That's Tiffin. It. That's it. 
That's all. It, one's <laughs> me. <laughs> Um, and that is a staggeringly low number. As yes. you'll come to see, as the list moves on, you'll see a, you'll see a, a wide variance of what we considered. Uh, but again, some of these being older games might have will have higher numbers just because of the age. And eventually, someone's going to play play it once or twice and rate it. Yep. And again, that was Tiffin with 106 ratings on Board Game Geek. Next up, we have one of our show favorites and I think people Mm -hmm. who listened, it's not a hidden gem to anyone who listens to this show, but outside of that, the fantastic go cuckoo, which so many people overlook as that kid's game, Mm -hmm. you know, something, maybe even like an Easter game, something that, you know, comes out seasonally or, or it's just, you know, around every once in a while, you know, let kids play it at the holidays, but is such a strategic and tricky (laughs) dexterity game that's totally worthy of being a hobby player's game. And yet only a thousand people have actually managed to rate it on board game geek. Yeah, this is, this is one everyone. I, again, I would have overlooked this one if it were not for T who showed me the game in the Haba booth at origins. Like, and then I also had to give props to Wayne Humfleet, the star Wars guy who said, go see T at the Haba booth. Cause she'll show you this go cuckoo game. Yeah. That, that, it's it's such a a strange game that's easy to overlook for various reasons the small little canister that it's in uh the colorful childish nature the fact that haba does do a lot of games for younger kids Mm -hmm. uh and yet gokuku isn't necessarily one of those next i have uh, a game i have never ever heard anyone else talk about and that is la boca which I now learned today has been reprinted under a new name. So that's fascinating to me. And I'm wondering if more people will get to hear about this game. This is a group party game where you play through a round robin tournament, pairing up with each other player twice to try to build buildings that look like the apartments in La Boca. But you're doing this with wooden cubes. You each sit on either side of the board. Then you put a card that shows what the buildings look like from your side. Your opponent has what the buildings look like from their side. You then have to work together to get these blocks so that both of yours are right. Then you slam a buzzer saying you're accurate. The other players check to see um, if you did it right. And if you did, you get points based on how quick you were able to do this. This is one of the most raucous player uh, party games I own. This gets a crowd going. It gets people yelling, high-fiving. I don't think I've ever done the sports belly bump in a board game except in La Boca because we were 0.3 seconds quicker than the last team. Fair enough. Now, admittedly, some people aren't into that kind of rocket well, no. game, uh, and that could keep it off some people's radar, but definitely sounds like a fun one and fun enough that at least 2,000 people have heard of it before. And that was La Boca. Now, next up, again, one that we have been singing the praises of, but it's clear that the word hasn't gotten out wider, and that's Mm -hmm. Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade, a deck builder that has so many new and interesting twists and usages that actually match the theme and work with the IP. It's not just another Dominion with the IP slapped on top. Uh can't really say enough good things about Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade, but only 518 people seem to have noticed it. I, I gotta admit, I don't remember if I rated this one myself. <laughs> but yes, fantastic game. I really like this one. And as a call out, because why wouldn't we? You can win a copy of Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade in our giveaway right now. Thank you, Japanime Games. Absolutely. Uh, next, I have one that when I was brainstorming this list, when I was putting the list together, I I was like, I don't know. I, don't, I, I, I totally missed it. And then I went downstairs to build our backdrop, as I do for all our podcast episodes, and fill the Cadillacs behind me. And I'm like, oh, Rail Pass. No one's heard of Rail Pass. No one knows this game exists. Uh, sure enough, only 323 people have ever rated it. So it's a little more well-known than Tiffin, but that is not a high number of, of, of ratings. Now, this is a pick up and deliver train game where you pick up and deliver trains. And this is long before Trader Mechanic, the Trader Mechanic game came out or Deck Builder, the deck building game. It doesn't even say that on the cover. That's actually what it is. And I think it's brilliant. You are literally loading little cubes onto plastic trains 
and passing them to other players. And well, if there's a train tunnel between you and the other player, you actually have to pass it through the tunnel. Even like uh, it's such a great game. It's a it's a real time game. Not going to be for everyone. If you drop your train, there's rules for that. If cubes fall off is all part of it. And really, when you get to the end of it, it's actually just a puzzle where you're trying to sort the cubes into the right colors. It is so much fun. Again, I get it. Not for everyone. But anyone who doesn't mind a real-time timed game, put it this way, Deanna hates real-time games. She doesn't love Rail Pass, but she likes it and is willing to play it. Yeah, I think I think this one is is niche, but even being as niche as it is, there's still there should be more notice to, given to this game than it's gotten so far. Yeah. Uh and uh so next up I've got Draconis Draconis Invasion. Now, this is a really fun Dominion-esque deck-building game uh, that's got some real strong points. And while it's not perfect, and we've talked about how dark the art in it is, mm -hmm. uh, overlooking the art, uh, it's got some really interesting timing mechanics uh, that gives you a sense of tension building mm -hmm. in the game and make for a very nice twist on Dominion with that fantasy uh, style rather than the, the more Euro stylings mm -hmm. of dominion itself uh and has got some expansion so you've got quite the card not not nearly as many as the dominion might have yeah and nothing no. has as many expansions as dominion <laughs> so uh it, it gives you quite the uh, the number of campaigns and ways to play that uh, draconis invasion and yet only 544 people seem to have cared yeah i think we called this one a hidden gem when we did our review and then we did a kickstarter preview for the uh, the, the we did a review of the one expansion that adds a campaign and then a Kickstarter preview for the other one that adds asymmetric powers. Uh, well, the neat part about this is it's Dominion, but it's kind of like Dominion mixed with Thunderstone because there's a building up your power to kill monsters thing. And that's where it really stands out. Otherwise, it's one of the only static market games that I really enjoy. Like for deck builders, I usually stay away from that, but it works in this game. And that was Traconis Invasion. Next, I have a game that I thought was out of print because it was put out by TMG Games, which sadly um, is no more. Uh, but thankfully, other companies are starting to pick up their games. This one did have quite a few ratings on Board Game Geek at 3000, but I don't see anyone ever talking about Gold West. This is a Euro. I like, yes, the theme is your mining, but is a Euro that uses a mechanic that it ends up I love and I wouldn't have predicted, and that is Moncala. Uh, very few games use this. You got Five Tribes, you got Trajan, and you got Gold West. There's probably others, but those are all good ones where I love it. Gold West is a game where you are picking a spot on the board and then putting resources over onto your um your like different bins, and then you're gonna sorry, it's sorry turn, you're gonna you're gonna take your resources and all your bins, you're gonna pick a bin. You're going to pick everything up and you're going to drop one piece and each bin going down. And what's left over, it tells you what you can do, whether that's go mining or build resources and everything else. Then it's all area control and Euro and there's a, a, a tracks with carts you're trying to move up and all this other stuff. And it does your usual Euro point salad stuff. But I really liked Gold West. That was a big hit for my group. I got to thank Lance, Lance Mixter, the Undead Viking. For coming out to me in Origins and going, you got to try this and handing me a copy when he worked at TMG. So I 3,000 people is not enough for this game. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about a TMG game here. This wasn't yeah. like some niche Kickstarter. This is a, this is a, a major market game that only got 3,000 people to pay attention to it. And that is Gold West. Now, next up is one, again, we've sung the praises of many times, but is still not apparently getting out there enough. So people, no. why are you not playing Gorinto? Now, this is just a fantastic game that's simple enough to, to set up and play, has some great components to it, uh, and yet has a huge variety of ways mm -hmm. to play and give it a giant amount of replayability uh, this uh, Garinto should have a lot more than 757 ratings on it. And talking like that is why Mark Spector is one of the sponsors of our <laughs> giveaway. No, the game is that good. It really is. I, I love Garinto. I, I listened to someone else complain that it was too samey, and I just don't get it. I, I don't get it. Like To me, that's like saying Azul's too samey. Why would I want to play it multiple times? I, I don't I don't see it. But we are definitely fans, and more people need to pick up Garinto. 
Now you can get it at Barnes and Noble with an exclusive expansion. So you don't even have an excuse that you can't find it anymore. That was Gorinto reviewed by only 757 people. The next one I have is shocking to me. It's Strasbourg. Only 2.7 people. And when I say Strasbourg, I know there's... thousand people. thousand people, sorry. <laughs> no. Well, two and a half people <laughs> rated it. So. seven people. You would not believe what we did to that third yes, person to get that That third rating. person did just terrible. It was horrible. <laughs> so Strasbourg, the thing is, I'm saying this, and I doubt there's a lot of people at their homes going, yeah, Strasbourg. Why is no one talking about that? Because no one's talking about it. This is... This is a Stefan Feld. It's a Feld. How how are people not talking about it? This is a game where you have an auction, then you have an auction, then you have another auction, then another auction, then another. And I think you do 38 different auctions, all to win majorities in different areas and place people on your board. Oh, wait, I said Stefan Feld. Do I really need to get into all the ways you can get points? There's lots. Have things in the corner. Match the patterns. Own all of the things. And all at the same time, you're vying for seats in the house of commons thing up at the top I, I is a fantastic it's actually one of my favorite felds and no one ever talks about this game i don't even know where i got it i think i got it when geektropolis cafe closed and i picked it up because it said stefan feld on the cover and i was like why is no one talking about this game i mean this was a spiel de jar kenner spiel nominee I mean, but it was 2011 and i think possibly it just came out a little bit too long ago and 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 just sort of caught the the beginning of the hobby board game rush uh or at least the current hobby board <laughs> game rush uh and so that's why Strasbourg hasn't gotten quite the love that it might now next up i've got one with 2.4 thousand likes which seems like a lot except those likes all came, or those ratings all came from a pretty niche group, I'm betting. Mm -hmm. And that's Minecraft Builders and Biomes. And I think a lot of Minecraft people heard about this because it was, you know, it was even featured on the big Minecraft annual show. Oh, wow. Um, they, they did push it uh, towards some Minecraft people, but I think the, the overlap of circles between Minecraft and board gamers isn't quite as large as they hoped it was. Mm hmm because the problem is, this is actually a good game. Mm -hmm. If you ignore the fact that it's Minecraft, because you don't have to have ever played Minecraft to play this game, it is still a solid game that requires a lot of forethought. You're, you're working in, there's three rounds to the game. You need to plan for your third round while you're still working to win, to, to you know, score points in the first round. Uh, there's a whole lot of, of sort of, it, it's, well, I mean, it's Euro enough that it's, it's mostly mm -hmm. single player solitaire, but you can, there is some hate drafting and, and things that can go on. So it's not like there's no interaction between players. There's just no direct action against right. players. Um, but, you know, my family loves this game. I know your family loved this game. Mm -hmm. uh, my, and there has been at least one expansion, probably yeah. even two. Yeah, uh, there's at least one. I don't know yeah. about two. Uh, and so I realist really... Minecraft Builders and Biomes, whether you like Minecraft or not, is definitely worth giving a look. So, so there was a set of promo tiles and one expansion. Ah, okay. So that's, that's what it is. There's a fishing rod and something else. Yeah, this one was good. Um, I will admit, I gave my copy to Sean because his kids probably enjoy it more than mine would. And I think that's true. Uh, my girls did enjoy it, though. They both liked it. They love the cube. Like mm -hmm. the fact you build this brick that you mine. To play which nice and thematic they did like this game that was minecraft builders and biomes not to be at all confused with minecraft the card game stay no, away from that no do not go near <laughs> minecraft the card game run away from that minecraft. that is a for a totally different list about things buried in the rough <laughs> deep deep in the rough <laughs> all right i totally get this one I totally understand why it only has 1.7k rating. Actually, I'm surprised it, it should have 12,000 ratings of people complaining. And that is the master of Orion, the board game. The thing is, this is not a 4X Twilight Imperium Eclipse-like game. It should be. The name Master of Orion belongs on a big epic game with tons of miniatures and tons of ships and random elements and politics 
No, instead, this is a rapid fire, very quick playing under an hour engine building card game, kind of like Race for the Galaxy without the bidding for what job you're doing or what turn you're taking. You're building your tableau. You can attack other players. When you attack other players, they can retaliate. You can only get so many points for attacking. So that's why. So it's balanced out. So it's not all about who wins, whoever has the biggest forces. This is actually a really good sci-fi tableau builder. But it says Masters of Orion on it. Even more importantly, they labeled two of the races backwards. So if you are a hardcore Mass Orion fan, you're already upset it's not the 4X you want. And then they got core lore wrong. So I get why it's a, it's a hidden gem and why people aren't buying this. But I swear if this game just said Master of Pluto or Master of whatever, the Venus Nebula, it probably would have did great. Well, and I, you know what? I think that this is the kind of game where there's enough people out there who don't know Masters of Orion anymore that could probably enjoy it because they don't know the uh, the origins and they won't notice yes. that there is there yep. are problems with the lore. So uh, if you I'll could admit, get a copy, I did not notice that part. I did not notice that someone else online pointed that out. They're like, oh, I'd like the game, but I can't believe they screwed up the Zinti and the. And I'm like, okay, I was a huge Mass Ryan fan, but no. By the time I played this, I that was gone from my head. Right, fair enough. Well, that was the Master of Orion, the board game. Now, next up is another one of uh, our our favorites that you you unfortunately can't get right now. No, we keep praying and we keep plugging away on Twitter, hoping that someone will take up the mantle and let us get be, let people be able to buy a copy of. But wait, there's more, which is a such a fantastic game from friends of the show uh, with only 556 yeah. ratings. It's just, it's just so sad because this game is so much fun. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a lighthearted party game, but a fun one. It's a positive <laughs> lighthearted party but game. A fun one. Sorry. No, no offense to fans of party games out there anywhere. <laughs> well, there are certain card based party games out there that I think people true. know what I'm talking about. Very This true. one is a positive, enjoyable <laughs> game where you're not putting things down and putting people down and, and insulting okay. people. It's just a I'll give it fun, you. happy game yeah this is one even the publishers if you are interested in publishing a game although i probably the reason no one's interested is it only has 556 <laughs> ratings and i don't know how positive those ratings are uh the, the one caveat with this this is a pitch game you are giving cards you then have to improv with them and give a pitch that is definitely not for everyone we have someone sitting in the room with me right now that absolutely hates the game but loves watching us play and that, that was that but wait there's more and that's Jay Cormier and Sen Fu Long Lim uh, yes. as the designers on that one. Which you can go to Breakout Con next weekend to meet Sen. I don't know if Jay's going to be there. Back then, they were known as the Bamboozle Brothers. All right, next I have the most popular game on the list, and I don't get it. So this is Hyperborea. This is a game where you look at the the cover of the box, and you think, a dungeon quest, sword and sorcery. I'm going to make a fighter and I'm going to go kill monsters and I'm going to roll dice. And the problem is that is not at all what this game is about. This was the first big Euro bag builder before even Orléans, where yes, you are playing a character, but your stats are represented by cubes and you're using them to move around a map and discover cities. And there's only one type of monster in the entire game, and it just represents there's monsters in this region. This is actually a fantasy 4X bag builder that I think is amazing. And I'm shocked by the number of people who have reviewed it on Board Game Geek. And my only reason I can figure out is because no one talks about this game in North America because everyone in North America who bought it was disappointed because they wanted Descent 3 and instead got this heavy Euro. Like, this is our friend Neil, the Euro Gamers, one of his favorite games. This is a great game, and I think all of those ratings are from wherever the game was published in Germany or whatever, because there's no one over here talking about this game. I only know one other person who owns a copy of this game, and the only reason they own it is we were in a game store when it was going out of business, and the guy running the store said, you can take anything you want, 20 bucks each. And I handed a copy to Neil and said, you want this. And he looked at it and went, doesn't look like our kind of game. I'm like, no, trust me, you want this. 
Hyperborea to me is a huge hidden gem still available. I double checked. This one's on Amazon right now. You can still get it, but you will never, ever find the expansion, which stinks. Yeah. And, and what I what I see is that when I when I do a quick scan through the comments, uh, there is a lot of hate from Americans. Yes, uh, <laughs> because it's not a. it yeah. looks like an Ameritrash sword and sandal romp and it's not. And yet it won. It was nominated for Golden Geek Best Strategy Board Game, International Gamers Award, General Strategy Multiplayer nominee. Uh, it it was big in some places, somewhere, not <laughs> just here, That's, not in North America. Yeah, just not here. Uh, I think. Like they, how can a hidden gem be a, a, a award nominated? But same. Even when I try to bring this one out, I'm like, "Hey, you want to play this?" Everyone's like, "Oh, cool!" And then I'm like, "Oh no, no, no! That's not what it is." Yeah, the, the box the box art, uh, interestingly, yeah. I think, really lets this one down uh, as it gives some false impressions. And uh, unfortunately, totally agree. Here we go. And that was Hyperborea. Now, next up is one that, again, I, I seem to do all the ones that we sing of praises of. Uh, but again, it's a fantastic game and it has gotten a little bit of love out there. And this is The Climbers uh, with just over 3000 people rating it on board game geek, but I've never seen people talk about it. I've never no. seen it anywhere except on our own table. Uh, and this is, and I think part of the problem is people think it is a dexterity game. And there is a lot of, uh, I will say, uh, dislike for dexterity games out there in some people, in some places, they know people who don't think it's a real hobby game. They want more, more Euro or more dice based and, mm -hmm. and, and don't want to have to deal with the dexterity, let alone the fact that there are certain people out there who have issues, uh, which I'll make dexterity games problematic. This isn't mm -hmm. a dexterity game other than the fact that you have to move pieces. Yes. Um, but there, there is no actual dexterity aspect to the game. It's simply a, a, interesting three-dimensional puzzle uh that that looks great on the table plays fun is incredibly frustrating to to <laughs> sort of think about it and, and work on uh and is uh downright impossible once you get about a beer or two in you so <laughs> that is the climbers my final one for our main list is something i only recently found out i think it was on our 2002 list not necessarily of new discoveries and that is Spell Smashers. This is a fantasy RPG. It's kind of the opposite of Hyperborea. This, this is a fantasy RPG where you are smashing and killing monsters by spelling words. This is a, a game where you're going to get a set of consonant cards, a set of vowel cards, and you're going to try to fill, uh, form the biggest word possible, but also taking into account the different elements and vulnerabilities and weaknesses that the monster you're attacking is. Uh, the person who delivers the killing blow is going to get money, which will let you buy more cards as well as equipment that gets you do things like have, um, you know, uh, wild cards and things like that. This is a fascinating game. I am not usually a big fan of spelling games. Not that I have a bad vocabulary. It's just the fact I usually play with my wife and my daughters who have fantastic vocabularies. And because you're dealing with a limited hand of cards, I find that levels the playing field. It's not just about spelling the biggest word possible. It's also about them finding those interactions and being limited to a set number of cards. Only 525 people have rated this, which blows me away. This is from a huge studio. This is Renegade Game Studios. This is not someone's small publisher that threw this game out there. And it just, it just didn't take off. And I mean, to me... This game should be in like every grade school out there. Yeah. I mean, this is a fantastic uh, learning game that, you know, it's it's a fun hobby board game that has a significant teaching aspect. Like this is one of those those hidden gems where you there's no reason to find it in the scholar's choice teacher's store hidden away. Mm -hmm. No, no, this is something you're going to find in your FLGS and still belongs in schools. Yeah, totally agree. So that was Spell Smashers. Now we've got a few uh, honorable mentions as well. All right. Number one, every time I was asked this question for a number of years, the number one game I would mention is Agizia. Uh, this has 5.4 hits, at least on the old edition. I don't know if the new edition's lumped in with this edition now. The second edition is a completely different game in a way, though. So uh, this is one that I used to talk about. I'm like, everyone's got to play Agizia. Every time I had a, a party at my house, a birthday, or um, New Year's Eve, I was always showing this game off to people. I still really enjoy this game. 
but I'm not putting it on the list tonight because Stronghold Games finally picked it up. They republished it, they tightened it, they made it more streamlined and easier to play, but then also to keep fans like me happy, they included the original game on the other side of the board, which was, I thought, a fascinating way to do it. Now, I have my old copy, so I didn't pick up this new copy, so I think it's fantastic it's out there, but I couldn't talk to if it improves the game or doesn't. So because of that new energy that came out for the game, I started to see people talk about this game again. So to me, it doesn't fit on the list, though I will say I'm starting to not hear anyone talk about it again. So maybe it's going to fade back into obscurity. So the new one from Stronghold is Egizia Shifting Sands. Yes. Uh, and it's only it's got 1.1 1. 1, uh, thousand ratings, uh, which for a game from 2019 isn't that bad. I mean, no, it's, it's not, not. Not a great time, time to be putting out a game. So if you still manage to get a thousand ratings, that's... Uh, that says a little something. Yeah, so it's up to like 7,000 now, which is better. So at least it's still out there. There is some buzz. Maybe if we redo this list in a couple of years, it'll be back on there because no one will be talking about it again. And that was uh, next, Yeah. Next, I have Euphoria. Build a better dystopia. Okay, like 10,000 people have rated this. So no, it wasn't a hidden gem. This was a big deal. People love this game. The thing is, it's from Strong... Or not Stronghold Games. I've written down from a Jamie Stegmeier... It's one of his early games, one of his first games, and it's just overshadowed. Stonemeyer has put out such classic games now and big hits and games everyone's talking about between Wingspan, um, Tapestry, and Scythe. No one is talking about Euphoria anymore. Like It's kind of like it disappeared off the planet. Whenever everyone goes, what's your favorite Stonemeyer game? Everyone's one of those other three in general. No one talks, or maybe Charterstone they'll bring up. No one talks about Euphoria anymore. So I had this on my list, but then when I saw 10,000 people have rated, I'm like, I guess I can't call it a hidden gem, but it just kind of feels like it's completely overshadowed by everything else Stonemaier has done since. I still love this game. It is still one of my top games, but it's just no one talks about it anymore. Yeah, and that, every once in a while, I'll hear people mention it, and the people who do mention it love it. Uh, yeah. everyone who's everyone who seems to have played it has always loved the game but uh again it just doesn't it doesn't come out you know it doesn't hit the table anymore it's it's that, that game yeah. that we used to like way back when and, and we've moved on now is sort of what it seems to be now my last uh hidden gem i wanted to throw out there is i wanted to toss one rpg on the list just because um and that is the game dream part and to me this is the biggest hidden gem role-playing game because it is super niche, and it's a licensed game, and it's from Artel Sorian, so the same stronghold, or uh, Stonemeyer problem of, Artel Sorian makes some pretty well-known games. This is a pretty obscure one from that publisher. So this is a game based on the Dream Park novels, and is the first, it is not the only, I th for years I thought it was the only RPG to this, but it is one of the first games where you play a character who's playing a character. You are playing a visit. Your character is a person visiting the dream park who is then going to go experience a dream park experience playing another character. So you actually have that neat two tiered thing there. And then you go have your dream park and there's a bunch of adventures and it does a lot of great stuff for onboarding players, like having the, the back of the rule book was like perforated with character sheets and all this neat stuff. OK, none of that matters, though, because at its core, this is a simple D6, add your skill, beat a target number system as simple as can be that works as a universal system so that you can do anything in the dream park. I found this to be the best universal system ever made. I enjoy this more than GURPS. I enjoy this more than Cortex. I enjoy this more than using D&D to hack Lord of the Rings. I think this is one of the best universal systems ever published by anyone. This is a game where I ran a running man style. You show up as your, your character and you're about to be dropped into a game and you don't know what's going to happen where you can make any character you want. I ran a game where there was a group was a Power Ranger, a mafioso boss, a Vietnam vet and a and a superhero and a member of the Star Trek bridge crew. They went out together and fought giant mecha in space Gundam style and it worked like it worked fine. There were no problems doing that. I adore Dream Park, and anytime someone mentions Hidden Gems, even if we're talking board games, Dream Park is one of the first things to pop into my head. Totally fair. And because, again, most people don't even know the novels anymore. Let yeah, alone it's the true. Game. 
So that's it for our list of hidden gem board games. Now, what's a game you love that you think deserves more attention? Comment to tell us all about it. Now, we're about to check in with the lobby, but before that, a quick reminder that we're here to answer your Gaming and Game Night questions. Click on Ask the Bellhop at tabletopbellhop.com, send an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or hit us up on social media where we can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Welcome to our detailed review of Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliance's core set from the op who we have to thank for sending us a review copy of this battling card game, along with its, with its expansions. The Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliance's core set, which I'm probably going to call Disney Sorcerer's Arena or just Sorcerer's Arena going forward, was designed by Sean Fletcher, published in 2022 by The Op, otherwise known as USAopoly. This is a two to four player card driven miniature skirmish game with a sliding difficulty scale featuring games that take under an hour. Now, while the box says this game is for 13 plus, we think much younger kids could totally get into this one if sticking to the early chapters. The MSRP on this core set is $39.99 USD. That's right, for the price of one character for cash price in the mobile game, you get a full game with six characters. <laughs> so take on the role as summoners in Disney Sorcerer's Arena. Conjure up your favorite Disney and Pixar characters to battle each other in the hex-gridded arena. This core set includes Sorcerer Mickey, Maleficent, Sully, Aladdin, Dr. Fusilier, Gaston, Demona, and Ariel. Through the use of movement and action cards, you will use your character to control key points on the map, knock out your rivals in a race to have the most crowns. Picking which characters to use and figuring out how they work together is going to be a key to victory, as is managing your hand of cards. Different game chapters let you scale the difficulty, making this great for gamers of all ages and experience levels. Now, while this game is based on the popular Disney Sorcerer's Arena mobile game and shares some of the same look and concepts, the actual gameplay is completely different. Mm-hmm. One of the best things about this new Disney game are the components, which you can check out in our Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Adventures Core Box unboxing video on YouTube. Now, the components in this Disney battle game are exceptionally nice. Good quality cards for each characters, oversized character cards, very useful reference sheets, including different ones for different chapters, a nice compact two-pulled board, nice thick cardboard punch-outs, clear instructions, and great-looking acrylic standees. A nice touch is that the eight character standees are two-sided acrylic, made of two pieces glued together, so that the artwork is on the inside. Each character has a back and front, and show and use plastic rings to show which team they are on, as well as tracking their current health. Now, I thought these were awesome. They look great, and I actually appreciate the 2D cartoon cell look of them. When they're out on the table. The only issue at all I have with these, and you get to see it in our unboxing video, is that they come with a film on each side that is really annoying to get off. The only thing is you only have to do it once. So once you get through that initial annoying thing to start playing, it's done. Overall, component wise, I was very impressed by this new Disney game from the op. You know, when, when they put those plastic covers on electronics, they leave a little tab. They need yeah. to start doing that on the acrylic standees, <laughs> yes. standees. something now, let's move on to what you do with these components with an overview of play okay a couple quick things to cover here so first off the rules for this game as i mentioned earlier are presented in multiple chapters there are four of them which while great for onboarding take way too long to go through here here's what you learn in chapter one and here's what gets added in two and here's what changes in three Instead, what we're going to describe here are the full rules, what you get once you are playing with Chapter 4, which is the, the final set of rules. Next, this is a two-player skirmish game with a lot going on, most of which is determined by the cards in play. Like most dueling card games, a lot of the actual gameplay comes out on the cards, not in the rules for how and when to play them. Now, with that out of the way, let's get to how to play. You start each game by having the players draft their team. 
The start player picks one of the available characters to play. Then the other player picks two. Then it goes back to the first player to pick their third character. And then the second player makes their third choice. Players then determine the order they want their three characters to act. Teams reveal this information simultaneously, and an intuitive track is made beside initiative track is made beside the board. Players then gather the standees, the oversized character cards, and card decks for their chosen characters. A colored ring is placed on each standee, and they are placed into the starting areas on the edge of the board. The card decks are shuffled together, and character cards are laid out in front of the players in initiative order. Now, each player is going to look at their character cards that summarize all your different abilities and stats and stuff and figure out your hand limit by adding up the hand limit for each individual character. You're then going to draw that number of cards from your now shuffled deck. Each player can then do a mulligan, but first they shuffle that hand back in before drawing a new one. You only get one mulligan. A game of Sorcerer's Arena is played over multiple rounds where each character activates once. At the end of a round, if a player has 20 or more crowns, or either player had to draw from their deck but couldn't, that round, the game ends. The player with the most crowns wins. In the result of a tie, more rounds are played until one player has more crowns than the other at the end of the round. Now, at the start of each character's activation, there's a number of things that happen. Status effects count down with triggered effects going off. The active character is on a victory point spot on the board, of which there are three of. They gain a crown for staying there for an entire turn. Knocked out characters return to play at full health, and the active player draws one card. Yes, you draw a card at the start of every character activation. That is like the hardest to remember rule for no good reason. You draw at the start of your turn, not at the end. <laughs> now, the movement action and skills phase is next and is the meat of the game. Each character can do any or all of these options in the order they choose, though each action must be completed before moving on to the next. So in the move phase, you move the active character a number of hexes up to their default movement value. Optionally, you can discard any movement card for any character from your hand to add one to this. Instead, though, you can play a movement card for the active character and do what it says on the card. In the action phase, you can attack a rival using the active character's default attack and optionally discard any attack card from any character to add one damage to this attack. Or play an action card for the active character and do what the card says. Now, many actions deal damage to rival characters. This is tracked using the colored dials on each standee's base. When a character gets to zero or less health, they're knocked out. The opposing player gains crowns equal to the number shown on the knocked out character's char character card. The KO'd character, of course, will return to play during its next activation. This is actually one of the big differences from the mobile game, as in the mobile game, the entire point is just to eliminate all opponents. That is a big change. The last option is to use a skill. Each character has one or more skills unique to them. When choosing to use skills, you can activate one or more of the character skills in any order. Now, this is what we meant by the basic mechanics being pretty basic, very simple. Now, what really makes this game fun and interesting is what those movement and action and combined movement action cards do. Through card play, you could have Mickey studying up to be a wizard by collecting broom tokens. Aladdin could be slipping through the crowd, gaining the stealth skill so he's harder to hit. Dr. Facilier could be shrinking his rivals, and Sully could shout out a bellowing taunt, forcing all attacks to target just him for the remainder of the round. There's one other thing to watch for when playing the full rules, and that's gears. Each card has a gear symbol on the bottom right of the card. After each phase, you check the gears in your discard pile against your character cards. Each lists a set of gears required to level up. When you've hit this total with a character, you remove the set of cards from your discard from the game and flip over your character card, unlocking a new permanent character ability. Now, once a player is done activating their character, they then discard down to their hand limit and end their turn. Now, again, the game continues until you get to the game end, which we covered earlier. But as a reminder, someone ran out of cards or someone hit 20 crowns. And again, if you're tied, just keep playing multiple rounds until someone has more crowns than the other. Now, the game also includes a four-player team variant, 
where each player controls two characters and you form four on four teams. The only real rule change is that a player can use a card in a teammate's discard pile to level up one of their characters. Yeah, and information is perfectly valid to be shared between. You can talk strategy, you can show each other your cards, and so on. And what's nice is the game does come with just enough characters to make two four-character teams. Now, a lot of Disney games have come out, especially in the last couple of years, it seems like, from hobby board game companies, not just mass market games and versions of Uno and Monopoly. Um, And due to that, I never know what to expect from any particular Disney game anymore. Game with a Disney name doesn't mean anything to me now. It used to be, if I saw Disney on the box, this was a kid's game. By default, this is a game that kids are going to enjoy and parents may or may not enjoy playing as well. This is definitely not the case anymore. While some newer Disney games are for kids, the majority, especially the ones coming out of the hobby game market, are not only for adults, but also for experienced gamers. Check out our reviews of Smash Up Disney Edition and or Disney Sidekicks for some examples of this. Now, personally, I'm not sure what to think about this. Like when I see the Disney name, I expect family friendly. Not necessarily a kid's game or something for little kids, but a game that the entire family, kids and adults, can enjoy together. This one we probably could have anticipated had either of us played the mobile game in advance of the board game, as the mobile game is currently celebrating its third anniversary, and so has been around a little longer. Yeah, now I'm just really happy that this particular game fits what I just talked about. This, to me is deserving of the Disney name. I don't want to sound that pretentious, but it nails that sweet spot. It's perfect for families, casual Disney fans, as well as being an engaging skirmish game for hobby gamers. And the secret to this is that four chapter onboarding system presented in Sorcerer's Arena. Now we've been going on about onboarding for some time now, and it's great to see it when companies really understand the need and implement it. Yeah, so when you start off this game in Chapter 1, you just have a two-player skirmish game that you can play right out of the box. Now, this is something more games need to do with the way the -the flash-in-the-pan board game industry right now is. People don't want to necessarily prep or read the rules or have to put everything together. This lets you put the game on the table, read the first few pages of the rulebook, and get playing. You only have two characters per side, which are already set, set initiative order. There's no decisions to make. You get to go right to the game. It removes most of the more complicated rules and interactions. You don't have skills, character cards. There's no way to boost your movement or anything like that. Even the point goal is lower, which makes it a shorter game. Again, better suited to new and younger players. This is not only a fantastic way to get the game to the table right away and to introduce the basic rule structure and mechanics. It's a great way to then later play the game with younger kids. Yes. Now, that said, this is still a family weight game, even at chapter one. This is not a kid's game. This is not one for little kids. There is a lot of reading required. This is a card game. you got to be able to read the cards. And learning the action cards, dealing with status effects, and the different card combinations does require some skill. I would think this would probably be good for eight-year-olds, potentially younger if your kids have gaming experience. The ability to understand the interactions and consequences of actions is really that key. It's one thing to read the words and understand them, but another level on how to grasp, how to make use of what you read. But I still say under 13, 13 plus what the box says, and I think that's quite high. I think at least by just sticking with chapter one, you could go way younger. Now, bumping it up, chapter two is probably the level I'd want to use to introduce the game to new people. Um, Here, you're going to actually draft your team. And I think that's the big thing is you're not forced into the pairings that come in the initial game. This way, everyone gets to play who they want. And because of that, you're going to now get all the different status effects in play because you have all the characters in play. To me, this right here, chapter two, you could stop. You have a great light skirmish game at this level. While simple, it's not simplistic. You're still dealing with ranges and movement as well as spells and choices and spending or saving. It would actually be a great way to take the ba- teach the basics of skirmish game games in general. I agree. Now, for me, Chapter 3 is when the game started to really shine. Now you have character cards with variable base movement and attack values. 
character skills leading to more decision points and ways to influence play. This is probably the level I would use to introduce the game at a hobby board game event. Unsurprisingly, this is where the asymmetry is introduced. And so, of course, that's where Mo is going to become most interested. <laughs> I would say it's not introduced here because everyone's deck is different. Asymmetry is there from the first game. Everyone's character deck is completely different in this game. But there is more asymmetry added at this point. Now, the final chapter actually only introduces one new thing to the game, and that's the gears and leveling up system. Now, this is a cool part of the game, and I get why they saved it for last. When introducing the game to hobby gamers who have played other hard-driven skirmish games, I would probably just start right with the full rules, right at chapter four. Yeah, speaking of diving right in at Chapter 4 and the full rules, there's an awesome combined rule book you can grab for free that skips the entire Chapter format altogether for those looking to just jump into the full game right away. It's on Board Game Geek and easily found with a Google search, and we'll be sure to toss a link into our show notes as well. Yeah, and this is actually strongly recommended by the designer of the game, who will, if you tweet about this game at all, jump into your thread and provide you a link. Now, personally, though I had fun learning the game bit by bit, I, I liked doing the onboarding. To me, that that was a, an enjoyable way to experience the game. I love that I got to break it out right away. Yes, I am the type of gamer who sits down and reads the whole rule book. In this case, I didn't. I read chapter one, then sat down and played chapter one. Then while my opponent sorted the cards, I read chapter two because the rule book's not that big. I found that was great. Even better, the onboarding was fantastic for my kids. My two kids are both at different skill levels when playing games. And we got to a point where it was worth stopping for the youngest, whereas the oldest wanted to keep going. And I thought that was awesome. What fascinated me, though, playing it through with the kids that I didn't notice when I did it with Deanna and even Sean, we played a few of these, is that the more rules that were unlocked, the quicker the game went. And the reason for that was that the characters were getting more powerful. We actually found chapter two games took longer than chapter three and four games because adding in the character skills and leveling really ramps up the damage done, the amount of interactions and how quick characters were getting KO'd. This is a small game board. And especially when you start with ranged attacks, things can end quickly if you get the right sequence of cards. Now, when looking at the entire game as a whole, like not each individual chapter, but as a box, I really dig how simple the basic system is right you do a bit of upkeep at the start of your turn then the active character moves does an action or uses skills in any order do this to move around the board control key spots and knock people out then it's just a matter of possibly discarding some cards check to see if anyone won that's it like that just taught you how to play the game in probably 30 seconds i just dig the flow of this game i think really most skirmish game fans probably will feel the same way despite the childish characters the game is anything but childish now the next highlight to me was just how different each character plays now as we already mentioned and as most of you know i love asymmetry in my games and this is super asymmetric not only does each character have its own deck with its own set of cards and they are completely unique there is not a repeated card there's no like standard card everyone has different characters have different health they have different crown values for knocking them out and it's not just based on the health well, Maleficent might have the least health or not worth the least crowns because she can be nasty. So she's actually worth more than Ariel, who has exactly the same amount of health. Uh, they have different movement and attack rates. Though I will admit in the core set, there's not a lot of variety here, but there is some. They each have a different ratio of gears in their decks, which actually makes it fascinating when trying to draft your team because the cards don't have the, well, they have some, they don't have enough gears to level up in their own deck. So Mickey does not have all the gears. Mickey needs to hit level two. So you have to combo him with someone that does to be able to make that synergy work. And this just leads to highly thematic characters who feel different from each other. For example, Maleficent likes to hang out on crown spaces. She wants to control the board. That makes her cards more powerful. A lot of her cards go off at better levels if you're standing on a crown. She also has a ton of spells including the biggest damage spell in the game. But she doesn't have much health and is easily knocked out. She's a glass cannon for skirmish game fans or anyone who played any video game ever. On the other hand, Ariel, who has the exact same health, is this set's only healer. While she does have some solid attack cards, her deck is much more about moving around the board, which I think flows really well for a mermaid, and healing adjacent allies. 
But she, he also, though, has the only card I've seen so far that can remove crowns or victory points from another player. This is one thing that may help drive sales in this game, as well as make for an interesting expansion roadmap. The characters seem to share, more or less, the same concepts and powers as in the mobile game. That's so players will be looking for some of their favorites from the 100 plus <laughs> wow. characters available in the mobile game. Uh, Isma and Tinkerbell are specifically are two that I'm looking forward to seeing to see how they play in the board game version. I got to say, with 100 characters possibly coming, there's a lot of room for expansion here. Those characters haven't been announced yet that I know of. Now, any card-based battle game is all going to be about the cards and what they do. And I have found Disney Sources Arena does a good job of balancing both the individual character decks. So you get a good mix of, you know, balance of attack and actions and movements, because that's a big part of this as well as balancing the potential combos and, and, and other parts of the game, which I think is impressive. Even with eight characters, it's pretty hard to balance that. This is something I hope they're able to keep up with all the expansions that have been coming out. Well, we haven't mentioned expansions yet. While the base game comes with eight characters, six of which will be in play during any one game, there are, of course, expansions out there you can pick up to expand your options. Each has three new characters in it, and some also add new rules to the game. Now, we have all of these, but we'll be talking about them each in their own review in the future as we dive into them. Yeah, at this point, I'm just playing around with the base game still, still having fun discovering things. Now, in addition to expanding your game through expansions, I thought this was kind of interesting, is that each player has their own core set, or if one player you know, is the, is the alpha gamer and picks up two of their own, uh, you can combine these. So that way, players can play the same characters against each other. While I get that in some settings this can be silly, I think it works for this particular game. Um, because you're playing summoners who are conjuring up aspects of the characters. So I don't see any, like, canon issue where we both can't have Ariel. Now, while I haven't gotten to try any of this, as I only have one set, I think the ability to duplicate would make some really interesting matches. Heck, the fact that a player can have a healer on both sides now is, is, is enough right there. Or seeing a character made from all the damage dealers can actually happen now. Yeah, I can certainly see groups buying multiple sets so that each person can have their favorite team, even if some of the players overlap. Stully being a great tank and combine that with Ariel's healing abilities for, uh, you know, potentially as uh, important aspects of some strategies. Now, one thing that I don't know if it exists from this game, though, I don't know if there was at least one official tournament, is if there's a meta for this yet. I don't know if this game is going to or has gotten to the level of the collectible card game, where certain players have their certain three sets that are considered the best sets right now. I have no idea if the game's going to get there or if it's already there already. I, the, with the pandemic, I think they they probably missed the the initial boat of having a big organized play program but it's something I could definitely see coming in the future if this game continues to be popular. Overall, I am really digging Disney Sorcerer's Arena. Uh, this is an extremely solid card-driven skirmish battle game. Though the best part of this game, though, is the way it can scale. With one box, you can fight quick battle between Mickey and Aladdin against Ariel and Gaston using simple rules, which are great for younger kids or brand new players. Or you can sit down with your experienced dueling card game friend and each draft your own perfect team, battling using the full rules to determine who's the best summoner. I believe that would be sorcerer, not summoner. Yeah, for some reason, your characters are called summoners. I don't know why. In, in the fluff for this game, you are summoners. Interesting. I don't know. That, I guess they didn't want Disney's summoners arena, or they were trying <laughs> not to compete with another big battling card game where you play summoners. The be. So they're technically planeswalkers in that game. <laughs> now, if you are a gamer looking for a solid family weight Disney game that you can play with the kids as well as challenge other gamers, this could be the perfect game for you. And it's reasonably safe to expect that with the popularity of the mobile game, this game will last and continue to expand for some time. Now, if you played other two player skirmish games and enjoyed them, especially card driven ones, don't discredit this game due to the Disney theme. This is a very solid battle game, especially when playing with the full rules. 
I think this is key. It's easy to dismiss Disney characters, and doing so would be a mistake. Just because the pictures are cartoons doesn't mean they don't have the depth of characters in other games. Now, for those who have always been curious about miniature battle games but never tried one, I think this is a fantastic introduction to the genre. And Sean actually called this out earlier, that this could be a great way to get someone into skirmish gaming. Now, one of the things that's missing from this game, and some people will miss, but others will applaud, is there's no hobby here. There's no painting, there's no making scenery, uh, and their chapter-based onboarding system is really good for holding your hand while getting you started, and then letting you run once you've figured everything out. Now, if you're a fan of the mobile game and would like something with some more meat to it, this will do just that. You get a lot of the game you already enjoy, but with a whole tactical layer on top of that that really explan expands gameplay. Though for now, your teams will be a bit more limited than you've likely got in your app. It'd be really nice if they do some kind of overlap, if you could scan a thing or something. I always wish whenever there's apps and games, I always want to scan my card in the game to get it on my app or some way to, if you buy something in the app, I get a version to use in my game. Now, due to the simplicity of the basic mechanics of this game, I also think this game may appeal to players who haven't liked skirmish games they've tried in the past. This one can be much simpler than some of the heavy war games out there and is much more approachable in general. If you're a Disney fan especially, you might want to give Disney Sorcerer's Arena a try, even if it doesn't seem like your kind of game. Well, that's it for our review of Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliance's core set a Disney-themed, card-driven skirmish battle game from the op. If you've tried this game out, we'd love to hear what you thought and let us know your favorite three-character team in the comments below. I also want to invite you to check out my written review of this Disney battle game over on the blog, tabletopbellhop.com. There, I was able to get into quite more details about what you get in the box and how to play. And now the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. All right, number one is a game from Bicycle, Bicycle Cards, who we haven't talked about since reviewing Exchange and the Alpha. It seems like Bicycle's got a thing going right now where they're going to release, it looks like, two new games a year with Crystallized and some kind of Truth or Dare game that I wasn't interested in coming out this year. Um, tried this game out. It's a four player abstract strategy game played with the kids in Brenda. Unfortunately, Deanna has not been able to try this game out, uh, due to the artwork, not working well with her eyes right now. Uh, now this is a really high quality production. I got to say, just like when we got the exchange and I opened it up on my two layer boards with sliders and sleeves, you got the same thing going on here. Extremely thick player board that's two layered. Well, not player board, like central board where you're putting little gems in it. And the gems are really neat. Um, some people are going to hate them because they're not actually symmetrical. They're not two-sided. They have an up and a down, but they look like little gems. Then you got these weird cube-shaped cards. And I don't mean the cards are cube, but they're like a flat cube. I don't know what shape that ends up being. If you think of, think of a one section from a Cubert board. Yes. And that's what you've got. <laughs> so yes, you've got basically Cubert tiles with gem patterns on them and what you're going to do is you're going to have three in your hand you're going to pick one to play on the board trying to match the patterns and trust me vocally i'm not going to be able to do this justice if we ever do a full review maybe i'll come up with a good way to describe this this might be our only video only review because i cannot you're trying to play cube make a giant cubert board with everyone else with rules where you can over cover over facets to make gems match now, the entire goal of the game is to get rid of your gems, and you have a random allotment of them in different colors at the beginning of the game. I think there's six different colors. There's nine of each gem you're trying to do, and then there's three extra. There's actually 12 of each gem. There's some kind of take your, uh, screw your neighbor thing in this game where I, I don't even know how to describe this game, but it's surprisingly solid. I, like, I'm glad I picked this up. It's, it's an abstract strategy, family weight game. Both my kids were able to pick it up well, though I will admit the one that has some processing um, issues did have a hard time with the cards. She was constantly trying to make the tableau we were building make physical sense, and and that way leads madness. Yeah. Uh, this is this is the game. This is the Escher game, and yeah. so you know, again, it's it's like the Escher stairs. It's or the Escher tile games. It's not 
going to make physical sense. And the less you try to make sense of it as you're staring at it, the less you're going to want to vomit all over the ta playing table. <laughs> that being said, though, it's not a bad thing. It's, it really is a fun game as yep. long as you don't try and hyper focus on this, again, you know, rain burny layout. Yeah, I, again, hard to describe without seeing it. Um, surprisingly good. Uh, an enjoyable game. Uh, locals expect to see this out at local events. Um, we may be doing some special things with this one because I was able to get a, an extra copy. So we might do something fun with that going forward. But uh, if you can find Crystallized by Bicycle, especially if you happen to find it cheap, it's probably worth picking up. It is a neat game. Uh, maybe full review coming sometime. This is something we bought. So we may or may not, depending on how it fits in. <laughs> Jumping over to something we will be reviewing because it's from the pile of obligation. Brand new to me game. Uh, this is Court. Uh, someone heard our Thrones of Valeria review and were like, oh, you like trick takers and reached out, which is very cool. Uh, this is a new trick taking game. Very traditional feel. This feels like a game designed by someone who does playing cards, not a hobby board gamer. Uh, it only has three suits from one to ten. And then there are a number of face cards as well. You are going to get your hand of cards at the beginning. Then you're going to get one random face card. And then you're going to play a trick taking game. Everyone has to follow suit. Interestingly, there's no Trump in this game, which I haven't seen a trick taking game without Trump in a long time. Um, though to me, there's kind of Trump because those face cards, you take a trick no matter what. But they're not technically Trump. I don't know uh, how to word that. Yeah. Um, th this one's a little hard to describe. Yeah, this I, I don't know. There was something about this game didn't hit me. Uh, a lot of the games, you know, I have a real strong opinion about one way or the other. Uh, and this one really kind of skidded off me. Uh, I'm not sure why. It wasn't bad. Uh, but as far as trick taking games go, the, I, there are other games I would I would choose before it. Um, yeah. and, and it's I've only gotten the one play. So I don't want to I don't want to sort of set my set myself up for uh you know making a fool of myself but at this point with just one play it was a trick-taking game uh, you know but uh i'd rather i'd rather play thrones of valeria or you know any any one of again a num a large number of tricky games we have available to us so i, I personally liked it because it did some new things that i've never seen before so one of the new things it's golf scoring the goal is to have the lowest store. And I know that's not unique to traditional card games, but it's pretty rare, especially for trick taking games. So you want the least points. The next thing I really liked, and it reminded me of Boba Majong, even though I know the games were created independently, is when you win a suit, you then pick which of the cards in that suit you keep for your scoring. But unlike Boba Majong, you give the other cards to the other players. And that was really neat. So but you do want to win suits. So you like, you want to win the trick with a big nine, but then you want to give the nine to someone else because you want the lowest score. And I thought that was fascinating. But at the same time, not only you want, you also want to set up your next round. Yes. Because the hand, the cards that you are left with after the round are your next hand of cards. Yes. Which that reminded me of Thrones of Valeria two player because Thrones of Valeria, you set up your deck at the beginning of the game. So yes, you if you you super load someone up with high cards, they're probably going to take a lot of the tricks next turn. Uh, what I'm not sure on at all is this was another game where most of the cards, all the odd number cards, had special abilities, and they kind of felt extraneous. Like they 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 I don't know. I almost want to try it without those rules. That that might actually improve it for me, honestly. Yeah. Uh, especially since one of the rules in particular was a a a card counter's dream where you got uh negative two points off your score for every other players who you could name one of the cards in their hand. Yeah. So if Which, you are a card counter, this game was made for you. And they, you know, they, this, this game very much uh, benefits you. Uh, and I am certainly, I have never been a card counter. <laughs> so there may be some of that. Yeah. I think my dad would love this. Cause honestly, after the first hand, it's perfect information from then on. It really is, because you know what cards got handed to everyone, what was in their tableau. They then just pick that up. Now, if you can memorize that many cards, good on you. 
But like knowing that one card's in there, now when I play the game, I always make sure to know two cards from every player. And I just get those stuck in my head. This, they have this and this just in case I have that one card, right? I, I don't know. It, it was interesting. I will say I, it was definitely not the worst trick taking game I played. And it is doing something different, which is what I appreciate. Yep. A uh, design of the cards just I didn't love, but they're going for that traditional card game look. So I get it. You're trying to look like playing cards. And something Sean has got to appreciate because we complained about it a lot. The cards were, for the most part, 99% reversible, except for the text on the face cards was not. But everything else, fully reversible. Yeah, and that was that was nice. It's it's nice to, you know, have playing cards that act like playing cards. Yes. <laughs> um, that was that was definitely a benefit. But yeah, I, I, I'm reserving final judgment, but yeah. so far it hasn't uh, you know, leapt out at me. Next, we have Azul Queen's Garden, which I think we talked about two weeks ago about how I unboxed it and everything. I don't remember if I did that on the last episode or when it was. Um, noted that the the teach was rough, rough to learn. Sorry, rough to learn. But now that I've got it down, it's better to teach. Yeah, so I, I, don't, still... I don't feel like the teach went badly at all on Friday. Okay. So I, I think I, I it's think hard we're... to tell on the other end, but I just know that there were parts people didn't get. So I we think... got later in the game and people are like, oh, I missed that. And to me, that before I feel like I fa failed at teaching when people miss some key elements. Now, I think it did help that on Friday, all of us had played uh, Summer Pavilion and were familiar mm -hmm. with Summer Pavilion. Uh, and I think that is the closest companion to Queen's Garden. Um, yeah. it, it's not like Sintra, thankfully. It's not yeah. like Azul Azul. It is similar in several ways to Summer Pavilion with enough yeah. differences to make it its own unique game. Yeah, it's got some funky rules, though. Like, uh, the drafting's quick enough to get used to. It's it's, it's unique enough. Um, but the payment system is just weird. The, what you pay to draft cards, or not the draft cards, to play things is odd, and the Joker system, and trying to remember when you s surround things, and then the two-player scoring, it's, it's just fiddly compared to all the other ones, and it's really opaque your first play. Like, like what you're scoring, how you're going to score, and what your final score is even going to be, you're not going to be able to predict easily as you're playing until you play it a few times. Yeah, I mean, knowing that scoring pattern and 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 how, how the scoring wheel works and things are, are certainly going to help. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't reward, uh, you know, ex expertise, like long-term play, but a couple of plays... And yeah. familiarity will definitely help. Uh, one thing to note is it is 20% more difficult than Summer Pavilion. Uh, <laughs> At with, least according to Board Game Geek. According, yes. yeah, according to Board Game Geek. So uh, I that, didn't keep that feel in that myself. I, I, I find, I don't know. Well, you know what? I think the, the fact to learn it, yes, but I don't think it's more difficult once you start playing. Well, I think, like, I think it's if, that if, if the teach is harder, the game is harder. I think it's yeah. sort of the the concept even though we get one we get more familiar with it and that we're used to, we're, we're able to play harder games we're used to harder sure. games so uh the other complaint i will say is it's long which i don't mind long games but i don't expect azul to be long and it doesn't feel like it's gonna get much quicker no the scoring is even just like just the fact that you've got to do this scoring is going to take time uh and there is certainly a level of ap because of the n sheer number of play of places and combinations and patterns you can build yeah. in the garden. Um, it's really hard to think about what the best solution is going to be. And again, because of the drafting system, planning too much in advance is going to kick you in the butt. Um, yeah. It's you're almost better to, to have a couple of ideas in mind, but not settle on anything. <laughs> Because... Do not count on a specific <laughs> tile coming out in that game. Yeah, because of the way the draft works, um, a a lot of a lot of things can suddenly disappear that you were counting on. Yeah. All right. At this point, we played a handful of times. We're not even at five. Again, this is an obligation. This is a game I got for Christmas. We may or may not do a full review, but for now, I'm digging it. I I know. Last time I talked about, it, I'm like, I don't know. I can't decide. No, I'm I'm definitely on the digging it. Right now, for me, it's the Azul I want to play most. But I think it's because I'm still exploring it, and I don't feel that I'm, like, good at it yet. Next one for me was the game, uh, the terribly named game. Uh, this one we played out at Kingsville, so we were out of town for Deanna's birthday. Uh, 
yes, we had a copy of Sushi Go and stuff in our room. So thank you for that. Um, in 31 and all that. Um, yes, we did spend some time at Banded Goose, but we did not play games. We just drank mainly because there was a live singer. And I have never been there or has been a long time since we were there on a Saturday night. That place is a very different place with a very different vibe with live music, people who are part of their mug club um, and a very packed bar uh, to the fact we ended up sitting up at the bar because that was all that was available. Um, it was neat. We, we had a good time, but no games played. So what matters, though, is on Sunday, Deanna's actual birthday. Um, I semi surprised her by having Tori and Kat meet us for dinner at the Grow Brewing Company, which is one of the few places that's open on a Sunday, but good enough that you're not complaining. They're the only place open on a Sunday. Uh, there, we mainly just hung out and chatted, had some fantastic food. Their food actually keeps getting better, which is impressive. So they do a Detroit style deep dish that's getting close to Armando's. It's not quite there yet, um, but they had some new flavor combinations. And the one I got, and I can't remember the name, was way better than the last one I got there. The other thing they've done, and I think this is fantastic, is they now offer a small. Now, this didn't matter because Tori was there and we split a large, but usually I'm forced to get this large deep dish pizza that I eat over four days. But I get it because I really want it. <laughs> so shout out to the Broke Grove. Um, they were pretty awesome. We were there. We started at six and we were there till 11, even though they close at 10. Um, there were multiple drinks had by the birthday girl um, and we hung out, but then we did play the game. I was not used to playing that with more players and I forgot it's easier with four players. Like the first game, we came really close to a perfect game where we played every card. We had like four cards left. The second game, we only had two left, so we didn't get it. And I don't even know what happened the third game. I think <laughs> some people started getting distracted and not paying as much attention. And, and we didn't do very well. Like, I think we had more than half the deck left when we lost. Still right. dig the game. I, I, it's one of those. It just keeps giving. I hate the name. I kind of hate recommending it. But, like, we keep returning to it. Like, it's almost become the new Duke for us. Because, like, the Duke can feel heavy. Or, you know, I had to pack it all with all the wooden components. This is just a deck of cards that you can throw in her purse. Yeah. So the only game we played on our actual Deanna's birthday weekend was the game. Well, on that weekend, I managed to get out to the barbershop bar for our monthly event. Uh, the next one will be happening April 15th at the barbershop bar. Uh, and uh, it was a lighter turnout this week, but it was the beginning of reading week. So I think a lot of people are, are sort of heading off and, and doing other things. Uh, I actually got in my first ever play of flashpoint fire rescue uh which mo has recommended any number of times and mm -hmm. i had just never managed to uh get uh on yet but uh again we uh, i had a great time we only played the basic rules but i am now looking forward to trying the full advanced rules um, yeah uh to be fair I, I have barely touched the full rules. I, every time we sit down to play Flashpoint Fire Rescue, um, we use the family rules, as they're called. Right. I have tried the each person has asymmetric abilities, but like I've never used the fire truck, for example, right. in that game. Well, it was actually interesting. One of the players we had at the table was a fire captain. <laughs> so yep. we, we wanted to sort of do the thing. And he actually, he actually kept giving us suggestions. Uh, we, we were crushed in the building. Uh, the, building oh. the building collapsed on us. <laughs> too much uh, hammering through walls? No, or, actually, or too much fire spreading? Too many, too many explosions. Uh, ah, we okay. had one room that was basically engulfed early on in the game, and all it was the like the largest room in the game, and so it it just nice. you know the shockwaves kept uh, knocking holes in walls. Did uh, you happen to save the cat and the dog though? Uh, we saved the dog. None of us were cat lovers. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> There were actually numbers of jokes about that when Ian wasn't oh, there around. there you go. <laughs> when, when Ian wasn't around. Uh, because <laughs> Ian, Ian is a cat lover. We, there you go. Uh, and uh, from then on, we actually went on and we played a three-on-three, two-team game of Drop It, uh, introducing that to a few new players. Nice. Uh, and that went as well as it always does. I mean, it's Dropout. It's really, it's really just a fantastic game, and no one has a clue what those pieces are gonna do when you did it i actually I, I i even i even went for a for a flick at the end just to see if i could pull something off and it, <laughs> it didn't work 
Rob, um, I wonder if we should have had drop it on our game recommendation list earlier today where you're talking about best hidden gems. Is I drop it a hidden it. gem? I, I considered it. I, I should have looked at the numbers and see. Yeah, it. we should have saw if a lot of people are talking. I've heard people talk about it. I've heard hype for drop it. Whereas the stuff we were talking about earlier, mostly there's no hype. So I'm, I'm just wondering. I have a feeling in a couple of years we might be talking about drop it as a hidden gem. Uh, and then I, uh, I when I while I when I first got there, while other people were setting up and things, and while I was trying the new po boys made by Sean, uh, I uh, read the rules to One Deck Galaxy, which was way more complex than I was expecting. Oh yeah, the weight. This game has got some meat to it, and it's going to um, take me some time to to figure it out. Um, even just you know the setup and the layout of the game and everything are, uh, it's it's. It's yeah, got it's meaty. I mean, it's it's a again, it's another one that's twenty percent higher or twenty percent higher than uh, the original one deck galaxy or one deck uh, dungeon. Uh, last one for me is Disney Sorcerer's Arena, as we were just talking about with the kids. Um, I did the full onboarding, uh, starting at chapter one, going all the way through. Uh, my oldest daughter loves it, like like really loves it. Was pushing me to play again today, and if we had had time before the show, we would have squeezed in one more game before our review tonight. Um, my younger daughter, though, loved the intro game. She loved chapter one. She kind of liked chapter two. And I thought this one was interesting. Now, I've mentioned many times in the show before, my daughter does have some processing issues. And I think this ties in somehow. What she was having a very hard time with, even though she only had one hand of cards, was controlling and thinking about more than one character. So the problem she was having was she would plan her move and think she's going to use one character, but then it was someone else's activation. Or she would mix up which cards worked with which character. And, and again, no complaint about the the design of the cards. It's very clear whose they are. But again, my, the, the, my, my youngest daughter does have some some issues processing things and did have a hard time with that. She She just, I don't know, on her turn, instead of focusing on the one character, was thinking about all three of them and how they interact and so on. Now, other than that, I think we probably said enough in our review earlier, and I am really looking forward to cracking open the first expansion and expanding our game. Well, this show wouldn't be possible without our Patreon patrons, our VIP guests. So here's a quick shout out to five of them. William Fisher. Thank you, William. Danielle and Owen Thomas. Thanks, both of you. Sean P. Kelly. Thanks to another Sean. Derek Hisson. Thanks, Derek. And Andrew Dacey. Thank you, Andrew, from all the way over in the pond. Well, that was the double bell. That means our shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the lobby doors. Though the doors are closed, you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com. All over the web is tabletopbellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice as the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Don't forget to tip your bellhops over at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. That's all for us tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us live, and we hope to see you back next week. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.